Hello friends, welcome back again to Discovering Revelation. We're glad you've tuned in again to this series in Bible prophecy. We had a great day here on the Front Range. We are in Colorado filming, and it was a beautiful day. Wherever you are, I hope you had a good day as well. We'll start with just a brief prayer before our quiz. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege we have to be alive. In spite of all the challenges in life, we do pray that tonight as we turn our attention to your word, you would bless us with your presence. And We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you ready for the quiz from last lecture? Five questions on our topic, Survival Keys for Revelation's End Time. If you have a piece of paper and a pen, let's go through these five questions. You can see how well you remembered or how well you listened. Question one, true or false, God wants us to be happy, healthy, and holy. Is that true or false? That's pretty easy. God wants us to be happy, healthy, and holy. Question two, true or false, the original diet given to mankind in Eden included clean animals. Is that true or false? The original diet given to mankind in Eden included clean animals. Number three, true or false, according to the Bible, the pig is an unclean animal and no part of his anatomy should be eaten. According to the Bible, the pig is an unclean animal and no part of his anatomy should be eaten. Is that true or false? Question four, true or false, a clean animal splits the hoof and, do, and chews the cud. Clean seafood has fins and scales. Is that true or false? A clean animal splits the hoof and chews the clud, cud. Clean seafood has fins and scales. Number five now. Christians will abstain from anything which defiles the body temple, such as alcohol, tobacco, and harmful drugs. Is that true or false? Christians will abstain from anything which defiles the body temple, such as alcohol, tobacco, and harmful drugs. Now we'll see how well you did. You can check your own paper. Number one, God wants us to be happy, healthy, and holy. The answer, true. Question two, the original diet given to mankind in Eden included clean animals. The answer is false. Question three, according to the Bible, the pig is an unclean animal and no part of his anatomy should be eaten. What's the answer? Answer is true. And then number four, a clean animal splits the hoof and chews the cud. Clean seafood has fins and scales. What's the answer? That is true, too. And number five, Christians will abstain from anything which defiles the body temple, such as alcohol, tobacco, and harmful drugs. And the answer to that is true. How'd you do? Did you get them all right, all five of them? I hope so. If you have questions as we go along, you can send your questions to discoveringrevelation at gmail.com. We'll email back to you your an the answers. <clears throat> Our study tonight is going to be on the gateway for a to a new life, for a new life. And your lesson is number nine. You can download that from our website, revelationsofprophecy.com. Just look for... I think it's the gateway to a new life. It's not number nine on our website, but you look for the topic gateway to new life and you can download the lesson. Our topic tomorrow will be probably one of the most important ones in our series, the seal of God and the mark of the beast. What is the mark of the beast? We'll find out in our study tomorrow. Then on Thursday, Revelation's Woman on the Moon. We will be studying from Revelation chapter 12. Very fascinating topic. Then on Friday, we'll be studying Modern Prophets, Visions, and Dreams. And in that presentation, I'm going to share with you my conversion story. Yeah, that's what I used to look like. I was a long-haired radical. 
I hated religion. I wanted nothing to do with the Christianity, but God changed my life. I'll tell you how that happened in our Friday night topic. Hope you tune in. Now we're going to sing our theme song before our lecture for today. And so wherever you are, sing along with us if you know this little tune. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We invite you just to bow your head where you are as we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that again we can connect through the internet, share your word. We pray your blessing on every viewer. And as we consider the gateway to a new life, we pray that indeed we might be able to begin a new life in Christ. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our topic today is Revelation's Gateway to a New Life. Let me ask, have you ever done something and then later regretted it? Have you ever wished you could undo the past? As you look back over your life, are there things you wished you could do differently? Have you ever wished you could live life all over again, kind of start over? Have you ever wished you could bury your past, all your mistakes, and begin with a new slate, a new chapter in life? Well, Jesus tells us that's not only possible, but it's absolutely essential if we want to be saved. He actually calls it the new birth. We're going to read about this from John 3, verses 3 through 5. If you're taking notes, you can mark that today. John 3, verses 3 through 5. Jesus said, Jesus answered and said unto him, speaking to this uh, religious leader, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So yes, we must begin life anew if we want to, if we want to see or enter the kingdom of God. Jesus was here talking to a religious leader named Nicodemus, a wealthy, influential rabbi, and the rabbi asked him how. In fact, let's notice that in the next verse. John 3, verse 4, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Burdened hearts from people all down through time have been asking that question, How? How can I start over? How can I bury my past life and begin a new life? Well, Jesus answers the question of how in the very next verse. John 3, verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So here we see the two parts to being born again. We must be born of water. What's that? That symbolizes baptism. And then we must be born of the Spirit. What's that? That signifies conversion, and conversion must take place before baptism. And you might wonder, how do we experience conversion? Well, the Bible tells us how, by receiving Jesus. In fact, you can read that in John 1, verse 12. The Bible says, John 1, 12, As many as received him, that's Jesus Christ, to them he gave power. How do we receive Jesus Christ? You can find the answer to that also in the Bible. In Revelation 3, verse 20, the Bible says, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. The door represents your choice. When you invite Jesus to come into your life to be your Lord and Savior, then he comes in and you begin a new life with Christ. That's being born of the Spirit. We are led to take this step when we see Christ's sacrifice for us. 
When we see him hanging on Calvary's cross, dying the death that we rightfully deserve, his life, his death, leads us to want to give our lives to him. In fact, the Bible t actually tells us in John 12, verse 32, Jesus says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, that's signifying his death on the cross, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Friend, have you felt that drawing love in your life? No doubt you have, or you would not have tuned in. You would not be listening to this series on Bible prophecy. As we respond to the drawing love of Christ and invite him to be our Savior and Lord, then we are being born of the Spirit. Not my will, but thy will be done, O Lord. That's a full surrender. All to Jesus I surrender. Well, that's one part of the new birth experience, accepting Christ as our personal Savior. But Jesus told us there's another part. We must be born of water. And that signifies baptism. And we're going to find today in our study that indeed baptism is Revelation's gateway to a new life. Jesus instructed his followers to baptize. Let's read that instruction in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. You can put that in your notes if you're following with your notepad. Jesus said to his followers, Go you therefore and teach all nations, and then what? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So Jesus told his followers to go teach and baptize. What does baptism signify or symbolize? And how is baptism the gateway to a new life? To answer that, we're going to go to the writings of Paul found in Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, the Bible tells us, Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in what? In newness of life. There you can see the new beginning, newness of life. Here Paul shows us the significance, the true significance of baptism by paralleling it with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Do you see that? Baptized into his death, buried with him by baptism, like as Christ was raised up from the dead. So you can see three things, death, burial, and resurrection. And then Paul says, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Would you like to start a new life? We are discovering in this presentation how that is possible. We bury the past and begin anew. You see, in the New Testament times, those New Testament Christians took the step of baptism to publicly demonstrate their acceptance of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection on their behalf, because baptism symbolizes death, burial, and resurrection. But more than that, it also showed that those early Christians were dying to their old life of sin and selfishness, and they were rising to live a new life with Christ. That's what baptism signifies. And that's why the Bible says in Revelation 1 verse 5, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Baptism actually symbolizes the washing away of sins. In fact, you can see that symbolized in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Baptism represents death, followed by burial, then resurrection to live a new life. Notice this in 1 Corinthians 15. We'll see the three aspects again, death, burial, and resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, Paul says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which also I received, how that Christ, what? Died for our sins according to the Scriptures. So number one, he died for our sins. 
and that he was what? Buried, there's number two, and that he what? Rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Baptism symbolizes all of that, death, burial, and resurrection. So we are uniting with Christ in the symbol of baptism, dying to sin and selfishness, bearing the old life, and then the next moment rising to begin a new life with Jesus. And that is why we say baptism is Revelation's gateway to a new life. You see, when somebody accepts Christ as their personal Savior, they want to bury their past, all their mistakes, and start a new life with Jesus. And that is done in the step of baptism. The person is placed for a moment beneath the water, representing what? Death and burial. Then the next moment they're raised up out of the water, representing what? Representing resurrection to live a new life. Baptism by immersion is a beautiful symbol of the end of the old life, death and burial of the old life, and the beginning of a new life in Christ. Well, that brings us then to this question, which is the biblical method of baptism? There are at least 14 different methods practiced these days. You're looking at a photograph of baptism by immersion, where people go under the water for a moment, then they're raised up out of the water. But there are people that say, well, that's a lot of work. You get all wet. It's not very convenient. All you need is to have some water poured over you, holy water, poured or sprinkled on you. In fact, some people say you don't even need water. You just need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. I heard of one group of people that were baptized in snow. They were <laughs> covered up in snow for a, a little while, and they said this was their baptism, a snow baptism. We'd have to go up in the mountains for that. And then I heard of this guy who baptized his grandson by telephone. I'm still trying to figure out how he did that. And probably the most unique baptism I ever heard of was this uh, lady. She met a pastor in a grocery store. And as they got acquainted, she found out this man was a pastor. She said, oh, pastor, you know, I've always wanted to be baptized. Could you arrange for a baptism? He said, well, lady, I could arrange for that right now, right here. She said, how will you do that? He bought himself a bottle of Coca-Cola, popped the lid, poured it over her. It was a Coca-Cola baptism, not the real thing. So how many methods are there biblically? Let's read the answer from the Bible. We're going to read from Ephesians 4, verses 4 and 5. Mark that in your notes today, Ephesians 4, verses 4 and 5. The Bible says, There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, and 14 baptisms. Huh? Is that what it says? <laughs> no, that's not what Paul said. The Bible says there's one baptism, not 14 different baptisms. And apparently that means there's only one method of baptism. That doesn't mean you can only be baptized one time, because we're going to see later in our study how that Paul recommended for one group of people to be baptized a second time. So apparently there's only one method of baptism that God will accept. And again, the question is, what is that one biblical method of baptism? Here's the answer. The method of baptism is determined by the meaning of baptism. Tell me, what does baptism mean? It means death, then what? After death, then burial. The person is placed for a moment beneath the water, representing the death and burial of the old life. So in every baptism, someone has died and we're having their spiritual funeral. The baptistry or the place where the baptism's taking place is sort of like a spiritual tomb, a spiritual grave. Well, that brings us to the question, who dies and is buried? Let's read the answer from Romans 6, verses 6 and 7. Romans 6, verses 6 and 7 says... Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. And by the way, that's not talking about your husband or your father. That's the old nature. The old man of sin that liked to do evil, liked to do wrong, didn't want to do right. That's the old nature. 
knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now that we've accepted Christ, we no longer want to serve sin. The old man is crucified with Christ. You've heard Paul saying, I am crucified with Christ. Verse 7 says now, For he that is dead is freed from sin. Would you like to be freed from sin? Then you must die to sin. It's easy living after you've died. <laughs> that sounds like a paradox. When you die to sin and self and live to serve Jesus, that's when you really begin living. You enjoy living. When something dies, what do we do with it? We bury it, right? Here's a point that I want you to mark somewhere in your notes. For new life to begin, we must first bury the old life. You can never begin a new life until you first bury the old life. It's sort of like gardening. If you want to plant corn seeds, what do you do with those corn seeds? You take and scatter the corn out over the ground, just sprinkle it, broadcast it. How much corn is going to grow? <laughs> Probably not too much. I don't know if you've ever planted potatoes. When I was a little boy, my father liked to garden. He still gardens today. He's 91 years old, still works in his garden. But I remember growing up in the garden with the gardening, and in the springtime, we would plant potatoes. And my father would go out there with his shovel, and he would push it in the ground with his foot, pull it back a little bit, make a crevice, and I would put the potato in there, the seed potato with the eye on it, and then he would pull out the shovel and he would stomp on that ground. He, we buried the potato. As in the natural, so in the spiritual. You can never begin a new life until you first bury the old life. The reason why some people have been unsuccessful in starting a new life with Christ is because they've never buried the old life. You can't start a new life until you first bury the old life, just as those seeds are buried. So, then the biblical method of baptism represents, first of all, death to sin and self. Then, then what? then burial, then next moment, resurrection to live a new life. That's actually what the word baptism literally means. The word baptism, what does the word baptism mean? It comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means to dip, to immerse, to plunge under water. The word originated from the dyeing of cloth. They would take the cloth and they would dip it all the way down into the color. And that's where the word originally came from, the word baptizo, to dip, to immerse, to plunge under. I don't know if you've ever dyed cloth. Ladies, you ever do that? What do you do? You take the cloth and you hang it up on a line and you sprinkle the color on it. Is that how you dye cloth? <laughs> I don't think so. You take that cloth and you completely dip it down into the color. That's where we get the word baptizo from, baptism. When something dies, do we sprinkle it? Suppose you came home and here in your lawn was a dead prairie dog. We live here where they have prairie dogs or maybe a dead dog or something like that. What would you do with it? Would you take and sprinkle a little dirt on that dead animal? Sh 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 sprinkle it. If you sprinkled that animal, what would happen? It would stink. The only way you can get rid of the stench, the smell, is to dig a hole and bury that thing. Let me say this very kindly. The reason why there are some stinking Christians today is they've never been buried. <laughs> You have to bury the old life in order to begin a new life. As in the natural, so in the spiritual. The word baptism means to dip, to immerse, to plunge under water. So one thing is very clear from our study today. Sprinkling is not the biblical method of baptism. Because the person is not going under the water and coming up out of the water. So we understand that does not qualify as a biblical method of baptism. 
The biblical method of baptism represents first, death to the old life. I've chosen to die to sin. I'm going to live for Christ. I've given my life to Him. Then, burial beneath the water. Next moment, resurrection out of the water to begin a new life. It's as if you have a new record. Before God, the old has been buried, all those mistakes, and now you're starting a new life with Christ. Here's a picture of a man that's just come up out of the water. And if you look carefully, he didn't even get his hair wet. <laughs> it's because he had no hair to get wet. That was in, from one of our seminars we did some years ago. This couple were baptized. That's his wife behind him. So he's beginning a new life, resurrection, the gateway to a new life. Here's a picture of a lady in Europe that was baptized after one of our prophecy series. First, she has died to self and sin. She's made the commitment to accept Christ as her Savior. Then you can see number two, she's placed for a moment completely beneath the water, representing death and burial of the old life. Next moment, she's raised up out of the water, resurrection to a new life in Jesus. Even Paul tells us that baptism symbolizes the beginning of a new life. Let's notice that from Romans 6, verses 4, 5, and 8. If you're taking notes, Romans 6, 4, 5, and 8. Baptism is Revelation's gateway to a new life. Romans 6, verse 4 says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in what? In newness of life. We come up out of the water to live a new life in Christ. Verse 5 now. For if we have been planted, note that word planted. How do you plant seeds? You bury them. And that's how baptism takes place. You're buried beneath the water. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, that's in baptism, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 8 now. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. This is the beginning of a new life. Baptism is Revelation's gateway to a new life. So we've discovered today the biblical method of baptism represents death and new life. It's a symbol of burial and resurrection. It is a spiritual funeral and a spiritual birthday. And the devil recognizing the true meaning, the true significance of baptism, he sought to bring in these counterfeit methods. Let me give you another text showing the significance of baptism. You can put in your notes 1 Peter 3, verse 21, where the Bible says, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's not like taking a bath, getting wet. But Peter says it's the answer of a good conscience. You see what happens when you're baptized according to the biblical method. You go under the water and you come up out of the water. Then when the devil comes to taunt you, to tell you about all your mistakes in the past, you can tell the old devil, look, I buried that man. I buried that woman. That person is dead and gone. This is a new creation in Christ Jesus. You see, you can't say that if you've just been sprinkled. But when you've been buried under the water, you've come up out of the water. That's why the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away, buried in the baptismal water. All things are become new, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Let's look at some Bible examples of baptism. John the Baptist was called Baptist because he baptized. Where did John baptize? Well, of course, he baptized in the Jordan River. But you might wonder where exactly in the Jordan River. The Bible tells us where. We're going to read from John 3, verse 23. The Bible says in John 3, 23, And John also was baptizing in Enon near to Salem. Why? Because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. So apparently to do the biblical method of baptism, you need much water, at least enough water where you can bury people beneath the water and raise them up out of the water. 
You see, if John had gone around to sprinkling people with water, it would have been easy. He could have taken some kind of container or vessel and gone all over Palestine, sprinkling people with his holy water. That's not what he did. <laughs> people came to him, to the Jordan River, and to a specific place in the Jordan River, because the Bible says there was much water there. And among those who came for baptism, we know, was Jesus. Let's see how he was baptized, because he is our example. We're going to read from Matthew 3, 13 through 17. Matthew 3, 13 through 17, the Bible says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? John recognized Jesus had no sinful past to bury. So he says, why do you need to be baptized? You should really baptize me. Let's notice Jesus' answer, verse 15. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, or in other words, then he baptized him. Why was Jesus baptized? The Bible says, to fulfill all righteousness. There are at least two reasons why Jesus was baptized. First of all, number one, to set us an example of the proper method of baptism. We should follow his example. The second reason, well, we'll come back to that later today, and I'll share with you the second reason why Jesus was baptized. Let's read on now. Matthew 3, 16 and 17 says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw, <clears throat> excuse me, the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I believe heaven smiles on every sincere person that takes the step of baptism. It's as if heaven says, This is my beloved Son or daughter. In them I am well pleased. We can know God is pleased with people that make that step sincerely. Of course, the devil is not pleased. He's displeased. But here it says, in whom I am well pleased. But notice, it says, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. Mark 1 verse 10 says, coming up out of the water. Tell me. Can you go up straight way out of the water if you've been sprinkled? Not possible. Can you come up straight way out of the water if you've been poured on? Not possible. The only way you can come up out of the water, straight way out of the water, is if you've been down under the water. John immersed Jesus beneath the waters of the Jordan, symbolizing what? Death and burial. Then the next moment, he raised him up out of the water, representing resurrection to begin a new life. Jesus is our example. And I might mention this. The Jordan River. I know people say, well, if I could be baptized in the Jordan River, that would be great. Do you know anything about the Jordan River? It's not a clean river. There was one man in the Old Testament named, and he didn't even want to bathe in it. It was so dirty. It flows brown most of the year. So mark this. It's not how holy the water is. But rather it's the symbol of complete immersion in the water and coming up out of the water. Let's look at another Bible example of baptism. This one in the book of Acts. This is the New Testament church. Acts 8 verses 35 to 40. And this is the story of the evangelist Philip who was sent by the Holy Spirit to meet a man, an Ethiopian man, that was seeking truth, reading from the Isaiah scroll. God is in the business of directing those who can teach truth to those that are seeking truth. It's no accident that you've tuned into this presentation. God knew you were seeking truth, and so he has brought you here that you might learn the truth. God brings people that are seeking to truth to those that can teach them the truth. That's exactly what God did here in this picture. So the Ethiopian is being instructed by Philip the evangelist. And they were reading from the Isaiah scroll. 
And as they read, in fact, verse 35 says, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus Christ. What did Philip do? Philip uplifted Jesus. And what did Jesus say? If I am uplifted, if I'm lifted up, what will I do? I will draw all men unto me. And as Philip uplifted Jesus, the Ethiopian felt drawn to him, and he wanted to commit his life to Christ. He responded. In fact, notice, verse 36 says, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? I want to bury my past, all my mistakes, and start a new life with this man named Jesus. I want to commit my life to Christ. I want to accept his death, burial, and resurrection on my behalf. I want to start a new life. Well, let's notice Philip's answer. Verse 37, and Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now watch, we're going to see a New Testament baptism. Verse 38. Acts 8, 38 tells us, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. We see both the preacher and the candidate going into the water together, and he baptized him. And then verse 39 tells us, And when they were come up out of the water, then you can see the biblical method of baptism. I can see Philip as he's about to baptize this man. He probably raises his hand in solemn benediction to heaven, and he says something like this. Because of your faith in Jesus... And your acceptance of him as your personal Savior. Today I baptize you in the name. What did Jesus say? When you baptize, baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son, Jesus Christ. We baptize in the name of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And then I can see Philip lay that man gently down beneath the water, representing death and burial. Next moment, he raises him up out of the water to begin a new life, a resurrection. They come up out of the water. I might mention right here, if you're afraid of water, you don't have to fear baptism because it only takes a moment. For one moment, you're placed beneath the water. The next moment, you're raised up out of the water. I remember years ago, we were doing a lecture series. We had a baptism at the end. Had about 40 people baptized. And there was a young man that wanted to be baptized that was deathly afraid of water. He had a phobia for water. I don't know if he took a bath, but he was afraid of water. But he wanted to be baptized. He wanted to follow Christ. So he asked to be first in the baptism. And I was in the back where they were preparing for the baptism there in the big church there. We were in Europe. And this man, he was, he was nervous. His hands were... I thought maybe he would faint from fear. I watched. We had a local pastor do the baptism, and I was watching there with the audience, and I saw this man come down first. He walked down into the baptistry. It looked so graceful. Pastor baptized him, came up out of the water. So afterward, I asked him, I said, well, how did it go? He said, you know, Pastor, when I stepped into the water, all my fear went away. So if you're afraid of water, you don't have to fear baptism. It only takes a moment. I've had people ask me, Pastor, when you baptize, why do you lay people down backwards? I say it's very simple. Baptism is a symbol of death and burial. Have you ever seen somebody buried face down? That would be a disgrace. We always bury people face up ready for the resurrection. And baptism is a symbol of death and burial. It's a perfect representation. For a moment, the hands are folded, the breath is suspended, the eyes are closed, the person is placed beneath the water, representing death and burial. Next moment, they're raised up out of the water, representing resurrection. There is the biblical method. And all churches used to baptize that way. You're looking at a photograph of a baptistry in Italy in a Roman Catholic church. Catholics used to baptize by immersion. 
Here is a, a statement concerning when they made a change. It was not until the Council of Ravenna, A.D. 1311, that sprinkling and pouring were officially accepted as equally valid as immersion in the rite of baptism. Before that, all churches baptized by immersion. The Orthodox Church, the Catholic Church, all churches baptized by immersion. The Bible way. So we understand today that the biblical method of baptism, not by sprinkling or pouring or snow, snow certainly not by Coca-Cola, but rather it's in a full baptismal tank, pool, lake, or river, or wherever there's enough water for the person to be placed beneath the water fully, raised up out of the water. That's the biblical method. Which brings us to the question, how does a person prepare for baptism? There are three steps to prepare for baptism. You can mark these today. Three prerequisite steps. First of all, you must believe in Jesus. That means accepting him as your personal Savior and Lord. Here's a text to show that, Acts 8.37. And Philip said, if thou believest, you want to be baptized? If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So number one, you must believe in Jesus. If you've accepted him as your personal Savior and Lord, then you've already taken the first step, believing in Jesus. The second step to prepare for baptism is to repent. Repentance means sorrow for sin and turning away from sin. Let's read a text concerning this from Acts 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you. So before we are baptized, we're supposed to repent. And we have already learned that repentance means sorrow for sin and turning away from sin. That does not mean you have to wait till you're perfect to be baptized. What it does mean, we should not be continuing in a course that we know is wicked. We know is evil. We must repent of sin. That's the second step in preparing for baptism. The third prerequisite step is to be taught the basic requirements of the Bible. Be taught to obey Jesus. And we'll read that from Jesus himself. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Jesus says, Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So Jesus says, before you baptize, you are supposed to do what? Teach. I know there are some preachers these days, they say, you want to be baptized? Please, come right on in, we'll baptize you, then we'll teach you. I say, now wait a minute. Jesus says, teach and then baptize. What are we supposed to teach? Let's read the next verse. Jesus says, teaching them to observe, that means to obey, all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So we must be taught the basic requirements of Scripture, such as the Ten Commandments. We should be taught to obey Jesus. That's the third prerequisite step. Number one, believe. Number two, repent. Number three, obey the commandments of Jesus. Now that brings me to this question. Does a baby qualify for baptism? Can a baby believe in Jesus? Can a baby repent of its sins? Baby doesn't even know what sin is. Can a baby be taught to keep the commandments? You can tell your baby. Now, baby, thou shalt not commit adultery. Baby has no idea what you're talking about. Babies don't qualify for baptism. The fact is you don't find a single scripture anywhere in the Bible that instructs us to baptize babies. Infant baptism is not scriptural. In fact, in Bible times, you can read about a whole group of babies that were, were killed. You can read that in Matthew 2, 16 through 18, killed by King Herod. But the prophecy in Jeremiah 31, 15 through 17 makes it very clear those babies will be resurrected and saved. They were not baptized. Hebrew babies were not baptized. That was not a part of Hebrew tradition. So we understand in Bible times they did not baptize babies. As a baby, Jesus was dedicated. Luke 2, 22. 
And we've had some beautiful baby dedications. We, my wife and I, we had both of our babies dedicated when they were babies. There was no baptism involved, no water involved. We brought them up. The pastor put his hand on them and prayed for God's blessing on them. We dedicated them to Christ. Jesus was dedicated as an infant. As an adult, Jesus was baptized. And you might be thinking, well, how old should a person be then before they're baptized? And my answer to that is, well, it depends on the person. Some people are mature when they're 12. Other people are not mature when they're 20. So it depends on the individual. But the person should be old enough to know right from wrong, old enough to receive Jesus as their personal Savior and have a personal relation, a personal experience with Jesus. If they're old enough to experience that, to do that, then they're probably old enough to take the step of baptism. Now that brings us to another question today. Many people ask this question. Is it biblical for a person to be rebaptized? If I was baptized by sprinkling, can I get rebaptized? Or even if I was baptized by immersion, is it ever all right to be baptized a second time? Let's read the biblical answer to that question from Acts 19, 1 through 5. Acts 19, 1 through 5. The Bible tells us, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to what town? Ephesus, and finding certain disciples. We already read earlier his letter to the Ephesians where he said there's one baptism. But here in Ephesus, we find Paul telling a certain group of people to get baptized a second time. So we understand it's not just one time, but rather one method. Let's read on. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Tell me, is it important to receive the Holy Spirit to be saved? Oh yes, you can read that in Ephesians 4.30. And they had not even heard about the Holy Ghost. So what did Paul say? He says to them, he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Tell me, how did John the Baptist baptize? By immersion. So these people had been baptized the proper method, but they didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they... They should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Tell me, was that their first or second baptism? That was their second baptism. Please notice, they didn't go through some profession of faith type thing and say, we believe, we profess we believe in the Holy Spirit. They were actually baptized again, rebaptized. So what's our answer to the question? Is it biblical for a person to be rebaptized? The answer is yes. The Bible does allow that. Which brings us to the next question. Who should be rebaptized? There are at least four groups of people that often consider the step of rebaptism. These four groups are, number one, those who were never buried. These are people that were baptized by sprinkling or pouring or some other method. And when they realized from studying the Bible that they really weren't even baptized biblically, then many of them, they want to be baptized again, the proper method, by immersion. The second group are those who never accepted Jesus. These are people that got baptized, well, because mom said so. Or because my father told me I was old enough so I needed to be baptized. Or the preacher, he got all the youth together and told us it's time for you to be baptized. All my friends were doing it, so I thought, well, I, best, I guess I better do it too. Some of those people later in life, when they develop a personal experience with Jesus, then they say, I want to be baptized again because now this is a personal experience. I've accepted Christ. I want to show that through the step of rebaptism. Third group are those that have fallen away from Jesus. 
These are people that were baptized at one point, but then for whatever reason, they drift out into the world, begin committing sin again, stop attending church. I can testify to this third group because I fell into that group at one point in my life. I was baptized as a young person. And then I rebelled against religion. Left home as a rebel, grew my hair long. I got involved in all sorts of wickedness. Um, I'll tell you my story Friday night. But God had mercy on me, and later in my life, I, His Spirit began working in my heart, and I re-surrendered myself to Christ, and later I was re-baptized. And I really date my Christian experience from that second baptism. The fourth group are those who were never taught to keep all the commandments. These are people who all their religious life, they never recognized they were breaking one of the commandments. I had a man tell me one time, he said, Pastor, I want to be rebaptized." I said, oh, tell me about it. He said, I've been doing some calculating. As I've been studying the Ten Commandments, I see I've been breaking the fourth one, the Sabbath commandment, and I've done it all my life. He said, I've calculated how many? I forget how many. It was <laughs> over a thousand. Uh, he had listed all the Sabbaths he had broken. He said, that's a lot of sin. I want to be rebaptized and start a new life. So for a person that's never been taught to keep all the commandments, oftentimes they too take the step of rebaptism. And I might mention that rebaptism is a personal thing between you and God. But I tell people, if you're convicted that you should be rebaptized, you'll never have peace until you follow through with that conviction. And I want to add something else today. For those of you that are thinking of baptism or rebaptism, we would recommend that you consider being baptized into a commandment-keeping church rather than to a commandment-breaking church. I think you recognize my point. Most churches today think you only need to keep nine of the Ten Commandments. We recommend take the step of baptism into a commandment-keeping church rather than a commandment-breaking church. Which brings us to the question, really, how important is baptism? Is it something that, we, that I have to do? Let's get the answer from Jesus. Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So is baptism is important? If I want to be saved, it's important. Jesus says, He that believes and is baptized, shall be saved. I have talked to people sometimes, and I ask them, are you baptized? They say no. And then I'll turn to Mark 16, 16. I read this to them. I say, well, Jesus says, if you, you must believe and be baptized to be saved. I say, you're not baptized. Are you saved? They say, well, I guess according to Jesus, I'm not yet. Why put off that commitment? So Jesus says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Well, now you might be thinking, is this something that I have to do? What about the thief on the cross? He wasn't baptized as far as we know. Well, the fact is he could not be baptized. He was fastened to the cross. He accepted Christ and he was saved. Christ promised him salvation. If that thief had come down off the cross, what would Jesus have expected him to do? to take the step of baptism. Here is the second reason why Jesus was baptized. Number two, Christ was baptized for those who couldn't be baptized. But listen, if a person learns about baptism and neglects to take that step or refuses to take that step, then can they be saved? Apparently not, because Jesus says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Now, sometimes people say, Pastor, are you telling me I have to be baptized? I say, really, baptism is not something you should feel like I have to do this. It should be something you feel like I want to do this. Let me illustrate this way. Here's a picture of my sweetheart, my wife. We've been married for 32 happy years. She's still my sweetheart. Before I married Sandra, did I have to marry this woman? Honestly, the answer is no, I didn't have to marry her. Did I want to marry her? Oh, yes. Could hardly wait. 
And it's the same with Jesus. When we come to love Jesus as our personal Savior, then baptism becomes something that, not I have to do this, but rather I want to do this, to show my commitment to Christ. And that brings me to another question. Should I wait till I'm perfect to get baptized? Well, let me ask you, should you wait till you're perfect to get married? If you wait till you're perfect for marriage, you'll never get married. Listen, marriage is not the public ceremony, public demonstration that two people are perfect. Rather, it's the public demonstration that two people are committed to each other. And it's the same with baptism. Baptism is not a public demonstration I've become perfect. Rather, it's a public demonstration that I have committed my life to Christ. You see, marriage does not create love in the hearts of those two people for one another. It's the demonstration of that love. They have now come to commitment. Same with baptism. Baptism doesn't create a commitment to Christ. It's the demonstration of a commitment. For example, we could bring someone in here. Actually, behind this screen, there's a baptistry. We could bring them in here. And we could baptize them. Suppose we brought a drunk in here. This guy is drunk. And we bring him down into the water. And we put him beneath the water. <laughs> he comes up out of the water. Has there been any magical change in his life? He, the only change is that he was a dry drunk when he started. Now after baptism, he's a wet drunk. That's the only change. <laughs> You see, the change of life takes place before baptism. Baptism is a demonstration of a change that has already happened. I am starting a new life because I've already committed myself to Jesus. And you can be sure that the devil is going to do all he can to prevent people from that step because he knows how significant baptism it is. You're starting a new life. You're committing yourself to Christ. Does the devil want you to do that? When people make a decision for baptism or rebaptism, it sometimes it seems like all sorts of things go wrong. They get discouraged. They get depressed. They have problems with their family, problems with their work. I say, yeah, it's, it's the old devil trying to prevent people from committing themselves to Christ. But Jesus has set us the example. He was baptized and he invites us to follow his example. The Bible says in John 12, 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Thousands of people around the world have responded to the drawing love of Christ and have taken the step of baptism. Let me show you some pictures. When we were, many years ago, we started ministry in the country of Ukraine after the fall of communism. And we had many people attending our meetings. Sometimes hundreds were baptized. Here's a picture of one of the baptisms there. Here is a picture of a baptism we had in the Philippines. Again, we had... Several hundred people baptized. Here's a baptism that we were involved with in India. This is some years ago. Many of these were former Hindus committing their lives to Christ and getting baptized. Here's a little group here in America. And you'll notice that I have an arrow pointed to one lady there in the little group, that lady with white hair. You know how old she was when she was baptized? 87 years old. Are you ever too old for baptism? Never too old for that step. I remember baptizing a couple one time. They were both in their 90s. You're not too old for the step of baptism. You might be wondering, well, are we going to do a baptism? Yes. If you'd like to participate in our Discovering Revelation baptism, we're going to have a baptism when we finish our program here, and you can be a part of it. The Bible tells us in Acts 22, verse 16, And not, now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Here it says, what are you waiting for? If you love Jesus, you want to bury your past, begin a new life, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Why not today? Make that commitment, that decision. If you've never been baptized, this is your opportunity. If you feel God is calling you for rebaptism, 
This is your opportunity. You can download from our website, revelationsofprophecy.com, a decision card for this topic. And you just look for the topic, Revelations Gateway to New Life. You'll see there it has a little box that says Decision. You click on that and it'll take you right to our decision card. And I want to go through that card with you here. You can download it from revelationsofprophecy.com. That little card has four lines, four boxes. This is the card entitled Gateway to a New Life. The first line says, I want to be truly committed to Christ. I hope that we can all check that box. You can put a little check mark in that box. And if you do it online, there's a box that you can check. You can tick there on the online card. I want to be truly committed to Christ. The second line says, I want to be baptized by immersion, as the Bible teaches, following Jesus' example. If you've not been baptized, but you see God is guiding you to that step, you can put a check mark in that second box. God will guide you as to when to take that step. We're going to have a baptism at the end of our program that you might be involved with that, but God will guide you to when. The third line says, I have been baptized, but would like to be rebaptized. If you're thinking of rebaptism, then you can put a check mark in that third box. And we will visit with you and discuss uh, rebaptism, some of the reasons for that. And then the last line says, I would like a personal visit to discuss some questions I have. If you'd like for us to visit with you, you can put a check mark in that box. Make sure that you put in your name and your address, your phone number, your contact, so we can set up a visit with you. If you're in the area, we can certainly visit with you. If you're beyond the area, then we'll make arrangements with someone in your area that can visit with you. Download that card from revelationsofprophecy.com. And when you're all done with the online card, just click Submit, and it comes right back to us at Discovering Revelation. Now tonight, we're going to sing just one stanza of a song that you're familiar with, All to Jesus I Surrender. We'll sing just one stanza of this card. You might, uh, this, this song, you might be filling out a card or filling out the online card. It's okay. While you do that, we'll sing just one stanza of All to Jesus I Surrender. <clears throat> All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence, daily live. All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. Sing along with us. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed. Blessed Savior, I surrender all. There is hope for you. By baptism, you begin life anew. There is hope for you. All your past sins you can bury too. There is hope for you. Don't hesitate like others do, because there is hope in Christ for you. There is hope for you, immersion is the method true. There is hope for you, other methods have no value. There is hope for you who choose God's command to do. Yes, friend, there is hope in Christ for you. Let's end our study today with a prayer. I'll invite you where you are to bow your head with me as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the simple step of baptism. 
And we can bury the past, all our mistakes and failures, and start a new life with Jesus. We pray your blessing on each one that is thinking of baptism, planning for baptism in the future. Prepare them for that step. Those considering rebaptism, prepare, prepare them as well for that sacred occasion. Keep us each faithful to you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Download our lesson, Purity and Power. It's number nine from our website, revelationsofprophecy.com. Don't miss our next study, The Seal of God and the Mark of the Beast. Until we meet again next time, friends, God bless you.